What's up, good people all across the world? This is the Driven in Black podcast. I am your host, David V. Lewis. And per usual, this podcast celebrates Black excellence all across the world. This episode is no different. Today we have a guest by the name of Leah Williams. We'll talk to her about a few topics. Leah, just say hello to the world. Hello, everyone. So excited to talk to you. So uh, before we get into uh, your career and uh, some of the reasons we're going to have this conversation, Jen, let's just talk a little bit about who Leah Williams is. Well, I um, was born and raised in Detroit, um, a product of Detroit Public Schools. Uh, I attended Cass Technical High School. Uh, I attended Eastern Michigan University for my undergrad degree on a scholarship, actually, the Wade McCree Jr. Scholarship, uh, which was given at that time to, in middle school, to students who uh, had a three point, minority students who had a 3.0 or above. And as long as you kept that grade point average when you graduated from high school, you would get a scholarship to your sponsored school. And my school was Eastern. So I attended Eastern. Um, for my undergraduate, received a bachelor degree in science. Uh, and then after that, I went to law school and um, attained my Juris Doctor degree, and I'm now an attorney. Uh, I'm a mother of three boys, uh, two bonus boys, and um, one biological. So my hands are full. Uh, my youngest is seven years old and just turned seven. Um, so I enjoy being a mother and a wife. Um, and I just enjoy my career and what I do. Okay. Excellent. And so we're going to talk about quite a few things. Um, there's uh, this dynamic story that you have uh, uh, that was captured in a documentary called Minds of Medicine. So I think I want to jump in right there. Okay. Uh, just give us a short synopsis of what that story was about. Well, it's been about uh, this year. Yeah, last year. Oh my goodness, this year, to be 20 years. So 20 years ago, um, my mother needed a liver transplant. Um, what was unique about our situation is, one, my father had passed just a few years before um, from liver disease, uh, unfortunately from, due to alcohol, alcoholism. My mother, on the other hand, um, her liver disease was a mystery. She never drank alcohol, no health problems. Um, just all of a sudden her liver was failing. Wow. So I had already experienced and went through the loss of one parent due to liver disease. So when we found out that she was going through the same thing and she had to be placed on the liver transplant list, it was hard. Um, but at, it just so happened that um, the hospital was starting a new procedure called a live donor liver transplant. And so they were looking for volunteers, family members, friends, but more, more so family members hmm. to volunteer for the procedures. So at that time, I was about, I think, 22, 20 something, early 20s. It was my last year at Eastern. Um, they sent the, the letter out and I saw my mom reading it. And I'm like, well, what is that about? And she she was like, oh, nothing. So I just kind of took it. And she was scared to ask if I would try to do it. And I automatically said, well, yeah, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So we went through testing. Um, the thing was, it was the first time it was ever done. It would, would ever be done in Michigan. Wow. And it was only a few around the country. So it was a very new procedure. So um, we went through it. Uh, so we were the first in Michigan. Uh, it was a 19 hour surgery wow. uh, where they took me down first to get me prepped and um, to start my liver. Then they would take my mom down. So we weren't in surgery together 19 hours, but the whole thing took 19 hours. So they removed the right lobe of my liver and transplanted it into her. And um, we did well <laughs> everything went well praise god um within a week of my surgery my liver functions were like at 90 percent back to 90 percent um 
I don't know. Most people know that the liver can't, if it's a healthy liver, it can regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. So um, by mine being healthy, it was able to regenerate very quick. So my mom is doing great. 20 years later, um, no complications, no rejections. Um, everything went well. It was like our surgeon said it was just the, the perfect case. Uh, yeah. We were a perfect match and everything went well. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on. That was a great story. Uh, I think we should stop there. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, so, you know, like I said, I was reading uh, a little information about you and I, that story is so dynamic. I thought we had to share that. But we want to focus in now on your career because you have a very interesting career and interesting enough you were actually heading into that career when the Minds of Medicine situation occurred, right? Yeah. So you went on to finish your school and yeah. kind of tell the world what your career is. And, you know, so you had um, certain practices that you started with. Kind of talk about that. Okay. Um, first, I want to start by, um, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, it's always been a passion of mine since I was a child. Uh, it was a lawyer, a teacher, or an astronaut. Those were the three things that I wanted to be. And then time, the other ones fell off, but lawyer always stuck. Um, one of the things I love is helping people. That's always been a driving force for me. So after I graduated from law school and I took the bar, passed the bar, and um, at that point, it was like, okay, now I'm here. What am I going to do? So I never really thought about what what area I was going to go into or what I was going to do. It's just, you're used to seeing the TV and the glitz and the glamour and the attorney just walks in and, you know, saves the show. And um, so I didn't know. So at that point, all I knew was I didn't want to do criminal law and I didn't want to do family law. Lo and behold, I ended up doing family law first. <laughs> and, and, um, and I think uh, as a start, it was a good area because for one, I got to help people, uh, which is one of my driving forces. And I didn't really realize how much I could help in that area. Uh, I worked in a nonprofit organization where uh, we helped victims of domestic violence obtain divorce, a divorce custody, parenting time, child support, things like that. Wow. Personal protection orders. So it was a very rewarding area. However, it was a very emotional area. Um, mm -hmm. Dealing with divorce alone. Um, I tell people there is a thin line between love and hate. And when people are going through that procedure, it can bring out the worst in um, both parties. So dealing with that as well as adding domestic violence along with it was a very emotional um, situation, but the reward was amazing. Um, when you can see that you help someone get out of a horrible situation uh, or get their kids because their abuser was holding the kids um, as a way to control the other party, um, it, was, it was amazing. <laughs> so I practiced that for a while, and then I um, went on to do uh, probate law. Probate is basically dealing with wills, estates, guardianships. It's kind of like family law, but just a different, um, it's an offshoot, I would say. And um, mm -hmm. sometimes it deals with death, you know, when the family member dies or just someone needs guardianship or custody of someone. So I did that. And the thing with that is I actually worked for two probate attorneys while I was in college mm -hmm. and in um, law school. So I had a lot of knowledge about it. So I was always interested in going into that area as well. So I practiced that for a number of years in conjunction with family law and other um, general civil matters. Mm -hmm. And then I landed um, where I think I found my niche was in social security uh, law, social security disability. And that was helping individuals obtain um, social security benefits if they are disabled. And so that's where I am now. Um, actually, now I kind of switch sides and now I work for Social Security Administration as an attorney advisor. And I basically advise the judges uh, on decisions on the law they should use to um, 
to determine if the individual is eligible for benefits. Okay, so there's a couple of things that you said there. I want to come back to this, why you say it's your niche. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I started thinking about um, you're a young black female and you've always wanted to be a lawyer. What kind of obstacles did you face with that, 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 that goal in mind as a young child? Well, as a young child, um, for one, I was, no one in my family had attended college. So that was one thing, like I had to jump that hurdle first, like, okay, finish school, then go to college. So that was one obstacle. Um, the other obstacle was law school. Uh, law school is very competitive. And um, I went to University of Detroit uh, School of Law, and which is a private university. And our class, our starting class, I want to say had 90 kids, excuse me, 90 students. And out of the 90, five of us were Black. So um, it was very competitive and just a different atmosphere for me. Now, you talk about growing up in Detroit, predominantly Black schools, uh, even at Eastern, I mean, there was still, you know, there's diversity there, but there was still a nice size um, black, um, I'm sorry, black, uh, student body. But, um, when I got there, that was a whole different, you know, scenario. And even in that aspect, um, as minorities or even as not just minorities, but as the black students, we were tra traditionally less likely to pass the bar exam wow. on the first time. So you kind of had a lot of things pulling against you um, in just society as normal. You don't, you know, you, a lot of people don't expect black people, especially black women to achieve these things. So it was, I won't say it was hard. I was very cognizant of these things, mm -hmm. but that was my driving force. Yes, mm -hmm. If you tell me no, I'm going to try harder. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to talk, I want to drill down a little bit more about that because I'm curious, you know, where does that confidence come from? Where, where does that uh, go for it kind of mentality come from? Because to me, I hear a lot of obstacles there, but they didn't seem to really bother you. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, my faith in God. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I've always lived by that model. Um, so even with that, I just, my mentality as a child has always been go, go, go. I'm not satisfied with complacency or I'm not satisfied with I can't do this. So um, even going to school, my mom, I was just always headstrong. My mom never had to tell me get up and go to school. She never had to say, do you have homework? She never had to say, you know, this is what you need to do. If anything, I was kind of guiding her because she didn't know anything about this process. So I will come home and say, well, here, you need to sign this. You need to do this. You need to do that. So I really don't know where it came from. Other thing I could say, it was just always in me. Wow. Um, that's saying it right there. All right. So let's get back to the niche or the niche, right? You said that the social security aspect of your law is where you feel like you're at most most at home. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about why you feel that way. Well, it it allows me to help others. Uh, and one thing I learned about myself, uh, I was in the in practicing law. I realized I was kind of better behind the scene, behind the scenes. Um, not that I wasn't able to go to a court and try a case and everything, but it was like my passion was putting puzzle, like the pieces together. And I remember working with one of my um, friends and she would always say, well, can you look over my documents? Cause you really know how to organize it and how to put it in a way that it kind of flows. And I realized that that was just more of my, I guess, I don't know if it's purpose, passion or whatever, but it's just whatever, I know how to put something together. Um, and so with Social Security, basically I am looking at medical records and I'm trying to 
piece the puzzles together to show how these medical records show that this person is disabled. Okay. And even on the, that's when I was representing individuals. And even on the other side, I'm still doing the same thing, um, just trying to justify whether the pieces fit or they don't. Yeah. So I think that's very informative because we don't think about lawyers behind the scene with paperwork, right? That's not the sexy stuff we see on TV. No. But such a <laughs> valuable role that's being played, right? For mm -hmm. people that probably otherwise don't get that paperwork done correctly if yeah. there's not somebody behind the scenes working for them and on their behalf. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, without the research, without the writing, there's no case. I mean, I know we've seen back in the day, it was Matlock and Perry Mason or whoever <laughs> walk in with the smoking gun all of a sudden. And that's just not real life. You have to really search for these things. You have to look for the law. The law is not always there. You have to try to find it somewhere else and make it fit to your situation. So it's not, like you said, it wasn't the glitz and glamour part of the law, but it's, I would say the most important part because without the background, you have no, you have nothing to say in court. That makes sense anyway. Yeah, so you're helping a lot of people uh, in your role. Now I wanna get to some questions like, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a black male, uh, you know, I'm not uh, a professional lawyer, but uh, I've g given out advice um, <laughs> to people that you can tell me if I was right or wrong, but I just believe black men should stay out of court. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> I think all of us should stay out of court, honestly. Um, but it just really depends on what you're not, definitely out of criminal court. Um, I know in terms of family law, a lot of men feel like the system is always pro-woman and whatever I do, it's not going to be good enough. And I can say yes and no to that. Um, okay. I think I would say the system is pro-custodial parent and usually custodial parent meaning the person who has the child. Usually the person who has the child is the mother. And so, yes, I would say they are pro custodial parent. Um, but I will also say that um, the laws, they have to follow the laws. And whatever the law is, that's what they do now. The legislator makes those laws. We elect the legislators. We elect the judges who interpret the laws. So it just, that kind of in this season now when it's election time that shows that we are, it's important for us to vote because yeah. um you choose who is making the laws you choose who are enforcing the laws like the uh, family court those judges are elected by us um you know on the federal level the the president appoints but we elect the president so it's just yeah. it's an ongoing thing that we have to get in and make sure that we're um, voting and getting those individuals in that will necessitate what we need as a people or just overall as a society. Yeah, so it's a lot there. I mean, um, we're, we are in a time where people are be beginning to be more and more involved with the process, but there is that crowd that says, you know, the voting doesn't matter, right? But if we are ever going to get to a place where we have social justice, um, we're going to have to vote not just for the presidential election, but for the local positions and be knowledgeable about those people, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, like I said, we appoint them. We, we, we directly vote for these individuals, not the electoral college like it is for the president. This is vote for vote is who you vote as prosecutor, as ju district judge, circuit judge. Those are all things that we do. And it's, it would behoove us all to make sure we're getting out there, not just because of our ancestors, but certainly because of what our ancestors do, did for us, but certainly for our living situation now. Um, and, you know, I know it's cliche, if you don't vote, you can't complain. And I think that's, I think, although it is a cliche, I think it's absolutely right. Yeah, but not true because people are complaining all the time. They're oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not going to stop. <laughs> all 
All right, so I think I got one more question with regards to Black folks and the law. Okay. Um, give me a, a, an example of something that we should know more about as a people upon entering into a courtroom. Uh, I think decorum, first of all. I think when you're walking in a courtroom, you need to act the part. I mean, you can't come in, I'm not gonna say with street clothes, but I'm saying just the your demeanor means everything. First impressions mean everything. You know, whether it's just the judge trying your case or if you have a jury, they're looking at you. And yeah. you need to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. Uh, so I would say dress accordingly. I'm not saying you have to have a suit on or anything like that, but just dress appropriately for court. I think um, they always say, you know, you don't have to hire an attorney. Some people can't afford an attorney. Um, obviously for criminal matters, someone can be appointed to you. Uh, I recommend you get one. Uh, it's just like, you know, you don't, you go online and self-diagnose yourself with a disease on WebMD. It's the same thing as you going into court trying to try a case that you don't know anything about. Yeah. So I, I do recommend you get an attorney, but if you don't, um, I just think you should try to be as knowledgeable as you can. Um, listen, listen to the judge, because even if you don't have an attorney, sometimes the judge will kind of lead it for you so you'll know what to do. So um, I just think most of all, you just need to prepare yourself and um, get as knowledgeable as you can on the law. But ultimately, I do think you should have an attorney. Mm -hmm. All right, so cool to have an attorney, uh, be knowledgeable about the law, yeah. knowledgeable about your specific case, and come dressed, come dressed apart. Yeah. Right? Come dressed apart. And right. be prof I mean, and speak professionally. Um, speak with deference. Don't, the judge is not your friend. There's <laughs> someone <laughs> that you you're looking to rule in your favor. So talk to them accordingly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Those are excellent tips uh, for all the people out there listening and watching. Um, so we have a question that we ask all of our guests, and that, that is, have you ever been on the cover of a magazine? I think I have. Uh, okay. A bill, I've, been, I've been on a billboard, me and my mom, for the, uh, okay. actually a few years ago. Um, that makes sense. Um, and what I... And Henry Ford Hospitals magazine, but not like life or anything like that. So okay, yeah. well, here at Dripping in Black, all, all <laughs> of our guests are placed on the Dripping in Black magazine, which of course is a, a greater honor yeah. than any yeah. other magazine. It is. Of course, it is. be Dripping in Black. I mean, what else is there? There I you are, Miss Leah Williams, attorney advisor, Social Security Administration, Dripping in Black cover. Thank you. I love it. All right. So we want to thank you for coming out to the Dripping in Black podcast. And uh, uh, I think I didn't ask you um, about going forward. Are there some goals that you have in mind going forward? You're in Social Security Administration. What's the next step for Leah Williams? Well, my next step, um, actually, I want to be an administrative law judge for Social Security Administration. So I'm working on that. It's kind of was in the works. We'll see how it goes after this election. Because <laughs> it is a federal situation. And so those laws matter on whether I can become one or not. So hopefully I will. Okay. God, <laughs> God will work it out and we'll have you back on as a judge. Yes, I, I received that. Yeah, for coming out. Thank you. Existence. We thank her for coming on, but we have reached the final segment in the Dripping in Black podcast. 
And those of you that have been following us know this is the last drip. The last drip. We have our last opportunity to give you a drip more of black excellence for that episode. And we try to tie that in with, um, you know, the guests and whatever they were talking about and some of our rich African-American history. And so today, we reach into Michigan history and we come across Martha Strickland Clark. In 1888, Martha Strickland Clark becomes the first woman to argue a case before the Michigan Supreme Court. All right, 1888. Um, in 1882, she graduated from the University of Michigan Law School and gained admission to the bar in 1883, which means she was able to practice law from that point on. Go blue. Uh, from 1883 to 1886, she would serve as an assistant prosecuting attorney in Clinton County, Michigan. In 1887, she would open up her own law office and become the first woman, not just black woman, but the first woman to practice law in Detroit. October 9th, 1888 is when Martha became the first woman to argue before the Michigan Supreme Court. The case was called Thompson versus Thompson. Martha would win the case that allowed a wife to divorce her abusive husband to kind of ties into uh, Leah Williams' start and, and her long uh, practice. Uh, in 1890, uh, Martha returned to the Michigan Supreme Court in a case called Wilson v. Newton. Uh, in this case, she successfully argues for a Genesee County woman, woman to hold the office of deputy county clerk. This, of course, is a far-reaching victory because it would ensure that many other women would be able to take jobs in local government. So, just a trailblazer, right? Um, in 1889, not done yet, Martha proposed a bill before the Michigan House of Representatives to allow Detroit women to vote in school elections. The bill would become ratified. She would also go on to teach parliamentary law and to found a school for women in Detroit. October 2006, Martha is honored posthumously for being nominated into the Michigan's Woman Hall of Fame, or Michigan's Women Hall of Fame. Our last trip, Martha Strickland Clark trailblazer in Michigan law, someone who paved the way for many women to follow in her footsteps, such as our very own guest, Leah Williams. All right, we will leave it there. Thanks to the Michigan Women Forward website, miwf.org, for the knowledge. And as always, get up on your black history. It's not taught in schools like we would like it, but it's available out there for those of us who are willing to search for it. All right, so we'll leave it there. And until next time, be good, be good, be good. It is a choice.